um, like Richard was describing, I really did kind of create a, a style which was prose poetry. And the, the, most of the book is entirely built of dreams and childhood memories. That was really my purpose. And in writing about, in writing dreams themselves, I created Fire's Eternal Morning as an exploration of the unconscious. And it's meant to be an exploration of the reader's own dreams erect in order to trigger recollection. It's sort of a psychological experiment in that sense. Um, so, in fact, it's been interesting in the past, the more I talk about this with people, and uh, it seems to trigger, uh, even in very unusual circumstances, in job interviews and things, people telling me their dreams all the time. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, this, the story itself is uh, of a young person trying to uh, make, find his way back from the precipice of lost and fear. In the aftermath of a global upheaval, uh, the character John Hobart picks his way through the rubble of cities, through romantic dreams of his youth, through the dirt paths of childhood landscapes, um, awakening in a state of amnesia, which is partly why it's all over the place in terms of uh, story. There are vignettes, each one is a, a short dream a story, so they're, it's composed of um, a, a stream of, uh, of dreams which really followed, especially while I was traveling in Europe on my own, of homesick during the Cold War, hearing about things that were happening, like a plane with the uh, H-bomb going down off of Spain, and I was in Spain at the time when that happened, and I'm going like, you know, uh, a lot of strange things. So everyone sort of grew up with this fear that, you know, we could all be annihilated very quickly. Um, so. Awakening in a state of amnesia, uh, Holberg thinks that the mil broken military weapon he finds at his side to be a child, a child's toy. He may be a child of the Cold War, fantasizing the adult intrigues, intrigues of espionage, or he may be a soldier lost in the images of, nu of a nuclear inferno, lost in the images of his home, which he may never find again. So I'm going to read one short story, um, which. Um, was actually a childhood memory, a childhood experience. Um, not very long. Um, back as a small child, he was with his mother. He was eight, and his sister Juno was five. After spending the afternoon shopping in downtown Bridgeport at Howlands and Levitt department stores, and especially H.L. Green's five and ten cent store, downtown Bridgeport, which he loved. It was a sunny afternoon on spring vacation, and now they were parked on a side street up around the corner from the entrance of the Columbia Records factory on Barnum Avenue in Bridgeport, where his father works, waiting for his dad to come out at 3.30. He was happy today because he had finally gotten something he had wanted for a long time, a beautiful set of tin soldiers which looks like the armies of different countries of World War I, British grenadiers, U.S. doughboys, and Germans with spiked helmets. Each one pointed a rifle or a pistol, standing, crouched, or prone on the ground. While waiting for his dad to come out of work, his mom and Juno are up in the front seat talking about girl stuff. So he starts setting up his army men, arranging them on the back seat, facing each other from across the upholstery, rumpling his brown jacket out across the, the seat to make hills and valleys and trenches for them to hide and ambush for each other. Since it's already warm outside, he opens, he opens the door and moves the battle to the cliff of the edge of the seat and sets up the Germans below on the little flat metal ledge beneath where the back seat door closes. Remember on the old fashioned car we had little running boards. Um, and the battle is poised to begin. There they are crossing the field with the allies above ready to stop the, the Germans from advancing. But suddenly the car door shakes as his father opens the front door and jumps into the front seat hugging and kissing mom and Juno. But when dad shuts the door and 
The car bounces again, and all the soldiers on the metal ledge, already unsteady, now are starting to fall over. It's too late for him to catch them all as they fall out of the car and tumble to the ground. Oh no, he yells, because he hadn't seen that the car was parked over a sewer grate, and the soldiers kept falling, already slipping down through the sewer grate, and the soldiers keep falling, already slipping down through the grate, and he is helpless to catch them. As the, solar, as the soldiers slowly drop and tumble down and down into the tiny bottomless pool deep under the street, for one second, for one instant, he can first see his own face reflected from above before the water swallows them up forever and his reflected image breaks into small circles. <laughs>